Just like that river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming. And I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too hard living, and I'm afraid to die cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky it's been a long long, long time coming Ooh. change gonna come to my brother and I say brother help me please there any winds up knocking me down back on my knees oh. there were times I wouldn't last for long, but now I know, now I know I'm able, I'm able to carry on, long time coming, Ooh, yeah. Change gonna come.
down before you can call him a man. Yes, and how many seas must a white dove sail before he can sleep in the sand? Yes, and how many times must a cannonball fly before they're forever bad, yeah. Oh, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many times must a mountain exist before it is washed to sea? How many times must a man exist pretending he just doesn't see? Oh, and how many times must a man turn his head pretending he just doesn't see? Oh, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. better beginning. I want to thank the Boys and Girls Choir of Harlem Alumni Ensemble for this magnificent performance. It puts us back to the midst of the 1960s and reminds us of both then certainly, and our hopes for the future. So I truly thank them. Welcome, everyone. I'm Arnold Lehman, director of the Brooklyn Museum, and I couldn't be prouder being up here than I am today. We are so delighted to welcome all of you, and particularly, I'm honored uh, to welcome our great member of Congress, Yvette Clark, who is right here with us. This congressional district could not have a better representative, and so we're really pleased to have her here. It is truly my great honor to have Congressman John Lewis, what am I going to say? Civil rights pioneer and great hero of the civil rights movement with us today. I'm also truly delighted to have a friend, Dr. Khalil G. Mohammed, the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. <laughs> Here with us both to celebrate our exhibition, Witness Art and Civil Rights in the 1960s. I know this will be a very spirited conversation and one that we are truly, um, truly looking forward to and have been looking forward to. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, Congressman Lewis, who represents the great city of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, was the youngest person to speak and now the last 
living speaker from the March on Washington. He's also the co-author of the New York Times best-selling graphic novel memoir, March, book one. And Dr. Mohammed, former associate professor of history at Indiana University, is also an award-winning author of The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern Urban America. Um, so we couldn't have two better speakers here with us today. Um, their subject, sort of broadly defined, um, is how history animates and empowers the social movements changing the world today and putting the civil rights movement into historical perspective and perhaps most importantly, connecting it to a new generation of social media activism. So it's, they're both here not only to touch the past, but to look to the future. My deepest gratitude goes to all of our great friends at the Ford Foundation, particularly Darren Walker, their terrific new president, for their exceptional support over the years, but especially for their wholehearted embrace of this exhibition and our programs that accompany it. Um, I'm also truly grateful to American Express for their specific support of the programmatic activities that relate to this exhibition and to Barney's. You know, these days you need a lot of friends to do something, to do something that's really important. Um, so I'm really grateful to them. And none of this would have happened without the uh, wonderful engagement of our Department of Education and Public Programs, Radia Harper, who is the Vice Director for Education and Public Programs, and Elizabeth Callahan, who's both worked really hard. Um, the exhibition would not have happened, and I have to extend my great thanks to Terry Carbone and Kelly Jones, wave at least. <laughs> Terry, who is Andrew W. Mellon, Curator of American Art here at the museum, and Kelly, who is Associate Professor of Art and Archaeology at Columbia University. They've worked tirelessly for a very long time to give us this new, deeper, and richer understanding and vision of the art and the meaning of this period. Um, one other thing, I believe you've all gotten a little note card. I hope many of you have gotten a note card, um, which is for you to fill out with a question about the subject matter that's going to be discussed here today. In the midst of the discussion, um, I guess we'll ask you to pass it down to the ends of the aisles. We'll pick them up, and then we'll use those as the basis as sort of question and answer. Um, during the program, at the end of the program. I think that um, is all of the administrative issues, though I hope if anyone has a cell phone, um, I don't, do I have to follow that, just dot, dot, dot? Um, please do what comes naturally to a cell phone in the midst of an important discussion like this. So I thank you all. I truly thank our speakers today. Um, this is a very important moment for the museum, um, for Brooklyn, and for our ongoing commitment to civil rights throughout this country. Thank you. When the uh, wonderfully talented Boys and Girls Choir of Harlem, not that I'm biased, uh, began singing the Black National Anthem. And we all sat first in wonder and in awestruck. It reminded me of a kind of metaphor of thinking about the role of the artist to lead a movement, to be ahead of the curve, uh, to use that creativity and that imagination in ways that actually help to spark change. And so 
in that brief moment when they began singing before we actually recognized what was happening to us, it made me think about the importance of the arts to helping to transform the world. Uh, were you yourself a fan of the arts, Congressman Lewis? Were you um, influenced in very significant ways by either uh, visual arts, performing arts, uh, as a young person? I was greatly uh, influenced by the arts, um, the paintings, the drawing, music. I've said on many occasions, without music, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. And he's a poet, too. Yeah. <laughs> but to, to see a painting, to see a drawing, it tell us about maybe the past, the present, but also where we could go, what we can become. You know, I had an opportunity, as you did, just a brief moment, to walk through and see some of the works of great artists. I was deeply moved and touched by the work of these men and women. Art is really a reflection of our, our hearts, our souls. And, and to pick up on this point, so first we want to give another shout out to this terrific exhibition, to our two curators, Terry Carbone and to Kelly Jones. And because, because Congressman Lewis and I did have a chance to see the show, we will both be back to see more of it uh, before actually starting this program. Um, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire a little bit because okay. you knew some of these artists who are in the show. Um, so Benny Andrews, whose work is the opening piece in the show, inspires the title of the show. Tell us a little bit about the relationships you actually had with people who were on the ground at various waypoints during the movement itself. Well, I got to know Benny Andrews, a wonderful man. Um, Benny was born and grew up in Georgia, in Madison, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, I met his brother, his mother. As a matter of fact, he did... Uh, illustration of a little book called John Lewis and the Lead. And, um, and when was the book published? Uh, it was published about uh, five years ago. And one of the illustrations, he had me as a little boy uh, talking and preaching to the chickens <laughs> uh, on a farm. We'll talk about the chickens in a minute. Yeah. But he was wonderful. Um, he went into the military, uh, he came back, he studied art, and uh, became one of the great artists. And, and Danny Lyons, I remember you telling uh, us Danny a great Lyons, story. Danny uh, Lyons, born here in New York, a photographer, uh, attended the University, I believe he was born in Forest Hill, and attended the University of Chicago, became a wonderful photographer. As a matter of fact, during the height of the movement, that sort of 62, 63, 64 period, he moved to Atlanta, came south in 1962 with a camera and said, I want to help the movement. He said, I'm a pretty good photographer. And the executive secretary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the organization that I was the chair of, sure. said, uh, use your camera. Go out and make pictures. Take pictures. And this young man went all over the place. Uh, we had a, a, an apartment uh, in southwest Atlanta. He became my roommate. And he used the bathroom as the dark room. Mm -hmm. And... Sometimes when you wanted to take a shower, uh, or be able uh, uh, to wash your face or brush your teeth, you had to move these chemicals around. It was a hazmat. And, so. and I was really <laughs> afraid that one night I would go into the bathroom and uh, use mouthwash and take the wrong. Uh, <laughs> but as I travel around America and other parts of the world, I see the great work of Danny Lyon. This young man risked his life mm. in Alabama, in Mississippi, 
in southwest Georgia. He was able to go into a stockade where a group of young black women, young, they were really girls, mm -hmm. middle and high school girls. They were middle students and high school students, all girls were locked up and put in a stockade. And Danny somehow diverted the attention of the jailer, and he was able to get in. And I've seen the photo, it's wonderful. Most amazing, yeah. and tell the story. There's a, there's a kind of um, electricity in their body language that defies the fact that they are, in fact, temporarily uh, incarcerated, just because ain't afraid of no jails no more, this sort of spirit that had taken hold by that moment. Uh, uh, people would sing a song, uh, Paul and Silas bound in jail, had no money to go on their bail. <laughs> and uh, then you have the caption of people in, in jail the, during the Freedom Rides, mm -hmm. during the sit-in. And these photographs would go all around our country and around the world some wonderful artists would come along with paint and a brush mm -hmm. and tell the story. Mm -hmm. And it inspired us. So it's, it's easy for us sitting here 50 years later and hear this music um, that, of course, helped to spur the movement and to sustain it. But I'm wondering, what was the music like when it was being heard for the first time? Um, See, it's canonical now. It's, it's part of our collective memory. But I'm curious, were there, was there more of the traditional gospel and spiritual song in those spaces where people were not quite ready for the latest rendition of the Civil Rights Anthem, something that Bernice Johnson Reagan had just put together and said, well, you know, we're not so keen on that one. Let's hear what we, I'm just curious how, how music evolved within the movement itself. Well, there were some of the songs that people gave uh, new meanings and sometimes they changed the words around. Mm -hmm. uh, take We Shall Overcome. Mm -hmm. It was a hymn of the church. And we start singing it as part of the movement song with a different beat. We Shall Overcome. And, and, you, and it became uplifting. Mm -hmm. And you knew somehow deep down in your being that we would succeed, that we would overcome, and I uh, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Mm -hmm. uh, people were saying a song like, I woke up this morning with my mind stand on freedom. In the church, they were saying, I woke up this morning with my mind stand on Jesus. Uh, on that point, because we're, we are sort of interested in this relationship between the past and the present, between this moment of youthful activism and the contemporary question about where young people might fit today, um, it, essentially what you're describing is a remix, right? This is, <laughs> this is in fact a, a tradition where young people take the received conventional traditions and the standards and say, mm, not working for, for right now. Was there resistance? Were, were there moments amongst uh, the parents and the grandparents that maybe playing around with these songs at certain times seemed uh, irreverent or um, against the sacraments of the church? Well, I think some people uh, had some problems, had some concern, but people were singing these songs in the church and it, to a different beat. Uh, and so people started staying with it. Singing in the church, it must be all right. <laughs> uh, if they're speaking about freedom uh, in the church, it's okay. It's all right. And people accepted it. Uh, so there was a Kirk Franklin in your moment. So. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> okay. But I, I remember when we were marching from Selma to Montgomery, people just sort of improvised. Back in 1965, 49 years ago, people would just make a song up. Uh, and young children would just start putting words there, saying things like, uh, Oh, Wallace, you never can jail them all. Segregation's about to fall. And, you know, in the sort of Negro spiritual, we sing a song, Amen, Amen. Mm -hmm. And they started singing, 
uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, amen, amen. Uh, someone else, they were called the names of individuals. Right. And people would just make up and improvise. Yeah. A little bit like calling out the ancestors. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned these chickens. So I know that, that some are familiar with, with your biography, and some may even know uh, this story from March. But for those who don't, um, tell us all a little bit about the, your special affinity uh, for our feathered friends, and particularly the way in which they gave you a sense of community that in some ways helped to prepare you for the larger uh, beloved community that you well, a, a much larger flock. Yeah, they, they, they prepared me. <laughs> well, well you, you know, uh, Dr. Muhammad, I, I grew up in rural Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. Uh, my father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, he had saved $300. And with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land that my family still own today. Mm. So. Well, on this farm, we raised a lot of cows and hogs, uh, cotton and peanuts and corn, but we also raised a lot of chickens. It was my responsibility to care for the chickens, and I fell in love with raising chickens like no one else could raise chickens. <laughs> I became very good at it. I became very, very good. And uh, from time to time, uh, most of the people here won't know anything about raising chickens. They may know something about Popeyes or Kentucky Fry <laughs> or Bojinga, but they wouldn't know anything about raising chicken. I'm going to give a shout out to Weeksville. Weeksville is teaching community, community gardening, so there, there might be a few people learning about chicken raising. Okay. okay. Well, let's compare notes here. <laughs> when the setting here was set, I have to, have to take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting here, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Because from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest, and there would be some more eggs. They would be fresh. You had to be able to tell the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. Mm -hmm. So when the little chick would hatch, I would take the little chicks and put them in a box with a lantern, raise them on their own. I'd just give them to another hen, get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and carry the setting hen and stay with that nest. For another three weeks, I kept on fooling and cheating on these setting hands. <laughs> and when I look back on it, it was not the right thing to do. <laughs> it, it, it was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most nonviolent thing to do. It's, it sounds like Congress. Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, somewhat. Uh, Congresswoman Clark will understand this. <laughs> but as a little boy, I, I, I just couldn't save enough money um, to buy an incubator or a hatchet. We used to get the Scissor Buck store, mm -hmm. or go to the Scissor Buck store, or get the Scissor Buck catalog, yep. that ordering book. It's a catalog, young people. It is a, a really big book. With it's, a big, it's a big book, it's a heavy book. <laughs> and some people call it the Wish book. I wish I had this, I wish I had that. <laughs> and some people call it the ordering book. Well, I just kept on wishing. But as a little boy, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach the gospel. So from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters and my cousins, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard, like this unbelievable audience that's gathered here in this hall. And my brothers and sisters and cousins were lying the outside of the chicken yard, but they would help make up the audience, mm -hmm. the congregation. And I would start speaking or preaching, and when I observed that some of these chickens would bow their heads, some of these chickens would shake their heads. They, they, they never quite said amen. <laughs> but I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to in the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me today in the Congress. <laughs> and, and some of those chickens were just a little more productive. Right. <laughs> But then you have this unbelievable artist, Benny Andrew, coming along, painting and drawing beautiful 
for depicting me preaching to those chickens. And he has a rooster on top of the chicken house with me holding the Bible, trying to convince or convert this rooster. <laughs> so there's a moment when chicken farming isn't enough. Um, and this is a, a, a terrific story about the arts as well. So at some point, the world is changing around you. Just 50 miles away, a 25-year-old Baptist minister shows up in Montgomery just a little bit before what becomes uh, the fire that lights the powder keg of the movement. And you come across a comic book published by the Fellowship of Reconciliation, published in 1958. Tell us the relationship of this comic book done by a graphic artist and your coming of age, or at least your introduction to the movement itself. Well, in 1955, at the age of 15, in the 10th grade, um, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on the radio. And I followed the drama of Montgomery. And I felt like Dr. King, this man, was speaking directly to me, saying, John Robert Lewis, you too can do something. You too can make a contribution. Years later, in 1958, I came across a copy of this comic book, 14 pages, sold for 10 cents, and Dr. King was one of the editors. He had edited the mm -hmm. book, and it was talking about the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence, how people use the way of peace, the way of love, to bring about change. And at the same time, a group of us students in Nashville at Fish University, Tennessee State, Meharry Medical College, Vanderbilt University, American Baptist, Peabody College, and some high school students started attending nonviolent workshops. And we went through a period of what we call social drama, mm -hmm. preparing ourselves. We studied the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. We studied what Gandhi attempted to do in South Africa what he accomplished in India. Mm -hmm. We studied the role in civil disobedience. And we were ready, we were prepared. We were prepared to engage in nonviolent direct action. This is uh, one of a couple of plugs that I'll make for the book uh, for March as we, as we move along. But I wanna take you back just to a moment of, of consciousness raising because it's an important thread that I wanna explore the rest of our conversation. So you're 15 and 55, right? Yes. Okay. So it's seven, you're 17 when you meet Rosa Parks and you're 18 when you meet Dr. King. Uh, in fact, my understanding of the story, but correct me if I'm wrong, you are inspired by the movement and that this comic book reinforces sort of your calling and you make it your business to get to Montgomery to meet Dr. King as an 18 year old. Just Tell us exactly what that was like leaving home just to go meet Dr. King, the, the conversation with mom and dad, um, the, the conversation with Dr. King, and the return conversation with them, because things are going to be different now. Well, when I finished high school in May of 1957, at the age of 17, uh, I applied to go to a little college called Troy State College, only 10 miles from my home. I submitted my application my high school transcript. I never heard a word from the college. So I wrote a letter to Dr. King and told him I needed his help. He wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. So you better answer those letters, anybody out there, if you get. In, in the meantime, I've been accepted at a little Baptist college in, in Nashville. It was during those days that I met um, Rosa Parks. In order to get there, uh, an uncle of mine gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had, gave me a foot locker, one of these big upright trunks, and put everything that I had 
everything that I own, my few books, my clothing, everything except those chickens in that foot locker. <laughs> and I took a Greyhound bus to Nashville. And after being there for about two weeks, one of my teachers was a friend of Dr. King. And I told this teacher that I had been in contact with Martin Luther King Jr. They both had attended Morehouse College together in Atlanta. So he informed Dr. King that I was there. So Dr. King got back in church and suggested when I was home for spring break to come and see him. Hmm. So on a Saturday morning in March of 1958, I boarded the bus and traveled to Montgomery. And a young African-American lawyer by the name of Fred Gray, who had been the lawyer for Rosa Parks and for Dr. King during the bus boycott, became our lawyer during the Freedom Ride and during the march from Selma to Montgomery, met me and drove me to the First Baptist Church in downtown Montgomery, passed by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, and ushered me into the office of the church. And I saw Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy standing behind the desk. I was so scared. <laughs> I didn't know what to say or what to do. And Dr. King spoke up and said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave him a whole name. <laughs> and, and that was the beginning. And he started calling me the boy from Troy. The boy from Troy. And it changed my life. Mm -hmm. I went back home and had a discussion with my mother and my father. It was so afraid. I told them that Dr. King said we would have to take legal action, have to file a, a suit, a lawsuit. This was to desegregate Troy State. This, right. right. And so they said, we'll lose the land. Our home will be bombed or burned. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I continued to study in Nashville. And it worked out. <laughs> but it was there that I saw Dr. King over and over again. I met Rosa Parks over and over again. I met Thurgood Marshall there. Mm -hmm. I met W.B. Du Bois there. And Diane Nash. Diane Nash, C.T. Vivian. C. T. Vivian and Jim Lawson. Jim Lawson, who was a, a, a teacher, and so many wonderful people. And it was time. Dr. King, and, and, you know, just being on Fisk University campus, all the, the great artists. Mm -hmm. So Aaron Douglas, he has a this great story. Uh, a a Aaron at, Douglas? Uh, at the, let me tell this, because this is a Schomburg plug. OK, so, yeah. <laughs> so the Schomburg Center uh, has uh, the Aspects of Negro Life murals. There are four murals, um, and they are on permanent uh, display. Congressman Lewis visited the Schomburg uh, just about two months ago and saw them, and all he could talk about was how he had missed the opportunity to really take full advantage of the fact that Aaron Douglas um, had spent the rest of his career at Fisk University um, right there, this amazing artist. Well, Aaron Douglas was one of my teachers, he taught me art appreciation mm -hmm. and uh, beautiful work, wonderful. Work. You know, if I had been a little more sensitive and a little more aware, I could have said, uh, Professor Douglas, uh, I would love to buy one of your works. <laughs> you know, I would say maybe, maybe my mother can pick enough kind to, and uh, maybe I can do a little work, uh, but I miss I miss an opportunity. Yeah, you could you could have I'm sure been a, a student uh, work study worked out some arrangement and you might have gotten something yeah. at the end of the term. But this this youthful moment I want to I want to play with because I think it's important when we think about the relationship of youth to activism today. You have to constantly remind people that it was the 18 year olds the 19-year-olds, the 25-year-olds, who were on the leading edge. And we've talked about this before, but I, I want you to put it in very clear terms what it meant to defy your parents' expectations and for those, and for the parents and grandparents of so many others who led the movement at that moment. Well, we grew up at a time when we saw segregation and racial discrimination. We were told over and over again, you cannot go there. 
you know, said, stay in your place. And my mother and my father, my grandparents, told me over and over again, when I saw those signs that said, white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women, I kept saying, why, why? They kept saying, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. I remember in 1956, when I was 16 years old, so inspired by Dr. King and Rosa Parks, going down to the public library, trying to check out some books with my brothers and sisters and cousins. And we were told by the librarian, the library is for whites only and not for colors. So I never went back to the Pike County Public Library in Troy, Alabama, until July 5th, 1998, for a book signing of my book, Walking with the Wind. <laughs> and they gave me a library card. That's the least they could do. So, they should have given you a wing of the library. <laughs> so in, in Nashville, I had an opportunity. I didn't tell my mother that I was attending these nonviolent workshops. I didn't tell her that I was involved and tested in, in the fall of 1959 when I was 19 years old. I didn't tell her that I was sitting in they read that I had been arrested on February 27, 1960. It was my first arrest. Mm. But the day I got arrested, I felt free. I felt liberated. I felt like I crossed over. And, and one, of, one of my uh, 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 staff. He didn't have staff back then. No, no. But, but one of my staff people just a few days ago gotcha. located a photograph a photograph of him being, being arrested the first time. Wow. And, and uh, I look like, look like somebody that's just proud, mm -hmm. almost smiling. Mm -hmm. uh, I had on a nice suit. As you do today. No, no, for a boy from the country. Um, had a vest. I went to a, a, a used store and bought this suit. It was a button. 500, and you know how much it cost? Five hmm. dollars. Hmm. And I probably didn't have five dollars in my pocket if they had served or something that day. But uh, I wanted to look good while I was sitting in, while I was sitting down. And most of the students did. And we were arrested and went to jail. We went with a sense of pride mm -hmm. and a sense of dignity. And hundreds of people here in the city of New York walked picket lines in front of Woolworth in support of the students in, in Nashville and other places. On that day, 89 of us became the first mass arrest. 89 of us was arrested wow. for sitting in. So, to, to <laughs> I want to talk not just about the role of young people in actually pushing the movement forward. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about your own sense of history. So today, it is hard to imagine a conversation about contemporary challenges, which we'll, we'll name um, in just a moment. But let's just say things aren't where we thought they might be 50 years later across the board. And it seems the history that motivates and inspires young activists today, so there's the dream defenders out of Florida, and Philip Agnew and others, is of course this moment. Right? It, is, it is the civil rights movement for them, uh, not just because of what it meant for transforming race in this country, but also because it, it was the catalyst that transformed so many other social movements that unfolded in the 1960s and 70s. But what was your sense of history? What, what were the stories being told about African-American triumph and achievement or struggle um, and the need for, for learning something about the past. Do you remember what those I, stories I remember were? very well. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the school that I attended, this overcrowded, poorly staffed, segregated school, I remember boarding the school bus and passing by the white school that we couldn't enter riding a broken down bus, they had new buses. We had to use books. I didn't like it. But I remember during the month of February each year, the 
we call it Negro History Week. We had to make scrapbooks. You're too young to know about <laughs> making those books. We, had we to, use Photoshop. Uh, well, we, well, we had to cut pictures of outstanding African American. Uh, could be George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington, W. E. B. Du Bois, Jackie Robinson, Ralph Bunch. We have to know something about the struggle, the leaders of the NACP, the, the early black members of Congress, the, the, the struggle of African American from the days of slavery to, the, to that period. So all of that, uh, and as, as a young child, I had an opportunity when I was in about the third or fourth grade to travel to Tuskegee on, on a field trip. And that's changed me also. But I used to argue with my parents a great deal about uh, how hard they would be working and uh, they were getting so much little for their hard work. And I would be out in the field sometime picking cotton or gathering peanuts. And I would say to my mother, this is hard work. And she said, boy, you're falling behind. And uh, she said, hard work never killed anybody. I said, well, it's about to kill me. <laughs> and, um, and, and from time to time. I have a son who says something like that. And, and as a little boy, I would get up <laughs> early in the morning, and I would get my book bag and put my books in the book bag. And I would hide under the porch and wait for the school bus to come up the hill. Then I would run out. And no one would know that I skipped going to the field uh, until they found out that I'm gone. I'm on that bus on the way to school. And I had a teacher who told me over and over again, read my child, read my child. And I tried to read everything. Mm. You were a bit of a troublemaker. You weren't exactly Well, I think I was born. I, I was born to get in the way. Yeah. I, 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 I had a calling to get in trouble, what I call good trouble, necessary good trouble. trouble. Necessary trouble. Charles Payne has written, he's a historian of the movement as well as a sociologist of education. And he's written about what, or at least called what Congressman Lewis is describing a sharecropper education uh, because so much of the rhythm of the calendar, school calendar, was around uh, seed time and harvest time. And uh, school was secondary to that. So what Congressman Lewis is describing is, of course, that uh, his parents really needed him out in the field and he was insistent upon going to school. We talked a little bit about young people, but I want to just, there's a, another kind of mythology around the movement. So we're talking about sort of how we remember the movement. We're talking about a sense of history. Well, one sense of history I think is, is worth having you explore with us is the actual scale of people involved in the movement. Um, I've heard you talk about how many NFL stadiums might be filled for everybody who was a classmate of Dr. King uh, or who had participated in the Freedom Rides. Uh, did you young people actually feel oftentimes that you weren't um, supported enough by the local communities where you came and actually tried to make a difference? Well, I think at time we knew and understood that so many people lived in fear. They were afraid. So we were free. We, uh, we didn't have jobs. We didn't have any responsibilities. Uh, we didn't have to pay a mortgage, um, but we wanted to be free. And we wanted to bring down those signs, and we brought them down. Mm -hmm. They're gone. Mm -hmm. The only places people would see those signs today would be in a museum, mm -hmm. in a book, or on a video. They're gone, and they will not return. Uh, and we grew up in a society where our teachers, High school teachers, elementary school teachers, principals, college professors, lawyers and doctors could not register to vote. They were told over and over again that they could not pass a so-called literacy test. On occasion in my native state of Alabama, a guy, a man, a woman would be asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap, the number of jelly beans in a jar. And the time came I think something was happening to us, yes, but we saw the wind, the change, 
blowing in Africa and other places. And I remember being on Fisk University campus in 1961 and 62 and 63, talking to African uh, students studying there, and they kept on teasing and joking with us, saying the whole of Africa would be free and liberated mm -hmm. before we were able to get a soft drink and a hot dog. And then the NACP had the slogan, free by 63. So, other thing, I was 15 years old when Emmett Till was murdered and lynched. He, I had, he was 14 himself, right? He was 14. I had first cousins who lived in Buffalo, and they would come home each summer. My mother, um, brother's children, and I thought it could happen to them. And then Rosa Parks come along a few months later. Dr. King emerged. So we had to do something. And you had all these young African-American men returning from the war. Mm -hmm. uh, they f went abroad to fight for democracy, fight for America. And they could be buried together. Had to be buried in a segregated cemetery. Right. They had to sit at the back of the bus. They couldn't drink out of a water fountain or take a seat out of lunch counter. In, in, in Alabama, especially in a place like Montgomery, black people and white people couldn't even ride a taxi cab together or stay in the same hotel. It's hard to ride a taxi cab still, but we're working on it. <laughs> so 50 years later, uh, so we're in this period of commemoration. Um, Looking back, uh, Dr. King is the first non-president and, of course, the first African-American on the Mall. Um, is there a lesson that we've forgotten in passing on to our young people? Um, are we teaching to our young people today that they ought to be grateful for what happened rather than, say, to be inspired to take on the challenges of their generation? Is it fair, in your opinion, for example, to say to a young person that maybe what happened to Trayvon Martin is an, a fair comparison indicative of what happens to Emmett Till? How, how do you talk to young people about 2014, about what their particular challenges are and what lessons they should know or learn from the movement? Well, I think we have to set to young people and don't try to hide anything, or sugarcoat it, chill it like it is. Um, I, I think sometime in our own communities, we try to shield our children, but they need to live in the real world. Um, in spite of all of the changes, in spite of all of the progress, they must be told the truth. The scars and stains of racism are still deeply embedded in American society. And we're not there yet. We're not there. I, I, I disagree with people saying we live in a post-racial society. It's not there. Uh, you look at President Barack Obama today. Uh, he's the President of the United States. But this man been called everything but a child of God. Um, I, I don't think, deep down within, I don't think a president of another color will be treated the way he's been treated. For, for a member of Congress, any member, but for a member of Congress, and this particular member from the state of South Carolina, to say to the president, you lie. Or for a governor of a state to meet the president and put her finger in his face. Uh, if, if, if you don't respect the man, respect the office, respect the position. So, about, about that finger, my mother's here. She taught me, if someone puts a finger in your face, they better pull back enough. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, my, my mother used to tell us from time to time when we were growing up, there were seven places in, in a little town of Troy. There was a certain street. And there was a certain city uh, in Alabama called Phoenix City. My mother would say to us sometimes, if I ever hear that you went there, if you're on that street, if you even went to, she said, I will kill you myself. I brought you into this world, and I will take you out. <laughs> so um, what about the new uh, challenge of voting rights in America that, um, that you would suggest a certain kind of organizing? What lesson, again, would you prescribe to those young people today whose voting rights are ostensibly under attack? Well, I think young people today, and not just young people, I think all of us, mm -hmm. those of us not so young, and not just African American, but all American, whether they're black, or white, or Latino, or Asian American, Native American, uh, we all should stand up, speak up, and speak out, and find a way to get in the way when it comes to voting rights. I have said it in the past, and I continue to say it. The vote is the most powerful, nonviolent instrument or tool we have in a democratic society, and we should use it. It is it's powerful. It is precious. It's almost sacred. And this year, we are going to commemorate, uh, not necessarily celebrate, but commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Mississippi Summer Project, where more than a thousand young people, many of them came from this city, came from New York, all over. They were white, they were black, but from this city alone, two young men that I knew, Andy Goodman, Mickey Scherner, and then a young, they were white, young African-American man by the name of James Shaney, went out on the summer night of June 21st, 1964. And in the exhibit, in the exhibit, is right downstairs, in an exhibit, an artist had drawn this unbelievable piece. And when I walked by that piece, I was deeply moved. I knew these three young men. Mm -hmm. Only met Andy Goodman for a brief moment, but Mika Scherner, and James Shaney had been working together in Mississippi for some time. These three young men were part of more than a thousand young people who came to the state to encourage people to register to vote. The state of Mississippi in 1964, 50 years ago, had a black voting age population of more than 450,000 and only about 16,000 blacks were registered to vote. They were stopped by the sheriff. They were on their way to investigate the burning of an African-American church. They were stopped by the sheriff, arrested, taken to jail, later taken out of the jail, turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, shot, and killed. I still cannot believe how in America that people would kill their fellow citizens simply because they're trying to encourage people to register to vote. And I tell children and young people all the time, these three young men didn't die in the Middle East. They didn't die in Vietnam or Eastern Europe or in Africa or Central or South America. They died right here in our own country. And they must be looked upon as the founding fathers of the new America. And today, the state of Mississippi has the highest number of black elected officials than any state. But people gave their blood to bring that about. Thank you. So how can a principle like love and action invigorate this new generation, given that particular history? Um, not for nothing, this is also a history that sees what happened in 64 um, sort of whitewashed um, the memory of it desecrated when then candidate Ronald Reagan shows up in Philadelphia, Mississippi uh, to become president in 1980. Uh, I mean, we actually live in the moment of the politics of the retrenchment of the civil rights era, um, a 
a recalibrating of what the civil rights movement stood for, which was not about the expansion of democracy for everyone, uh, but somehow this sort of polite um, moment to change a few laws and yet to get back to business as usual. Um, that may not be the best characterization of it because it's hard to find a few words to describe what has happened over the past uh, 30 years. But uh, to think about 1968 as a kind of turning point from the end of the legislative achievements of the movement to the moment where we essentially mark the beginning of the war on drugs. Is there even a context sufficient to capture this principle of love in action? And I'm, I'm assuming you're going to give us hope here, so. Well, <laughs> I, I think in spite of all of, the, all of the difficulties, in spite of some of the disappointments and setbacks, we have to be hopeful. We have to be optimistic. It is in keeping with the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence to be hopeful, to be optimistic. I, I like to think of even the opposition, even the people who, who beat us, who jail us, who assassinated some of our leaders and killed our friends. Last Saturday, I was in Mississippi. I, I went to the home of, of Meg Evers. I still in the driveway where he was assassinated. Um, and I cried. Um, this young man was a veteran, um, came home to Mississippi, and became the field secretary for the NACP. He was assassinated the same evening that President Kennedy had delivered an unbelievable speech to the nation, June 11, 1963. And to see what happened to this man, to his family, you could get lost in, in, in a sea of despair. You could become bitter and hostile. But we cannot afford to become bitter or hostile. We have to pick up and keep going. People ask me from time to time, why are you not bitter? You got arrested 40 times. You were beaten and left bloody uh, in Rocky, South Carolina at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery during the Freedom Ride. He had a concussion at the bridge in Selma in 1965. But you have to look up on the opposition. Even a person that, that would beat you, you know, we're not born bitter. When we come into this world, we like, we're little babies. Like baby chicks. We're like, <laughs> well, we're, well, we're innocent. No, that's okay, we're innocent. We, we, we're innocent, and something happened. We, we're not born hating people. Mm -hmm. We're not born putting someone down because of the color of their skin. And I think art, when you walk through this exhibit, it, it says something about then, maybe now, and where we can go. There's a piece there saying something about the beloved community mm -hmm. that Dr. King spoke about, those of us in the student nonviolent group, that we can create a beloved community that respect the dignity and the worth of every human being. And that's where we must go. And because we all live in the same house. And, and it's not just the American house, it's the world house. And it doesn't matter whether you're black a Latino, Asian American, a Native American, straight or gay, a Democrat or Republican. I may have some argument there, but you know. <laughs> but we're one people, we're one family, we're one house. We all live in the same house, the world house. And as Dr. King would say, we got to learn to live together as brothers and sisters of your parents as fools. All right. So there are some questions from the audience, and uh, I'll start with this one. Was there ever a time where you felt like giving up on your fight for freedom? There's never 
been a time when I felt like giving up or turning back. I think uh, Bernice Regan and some of the other artists were saying, we shall not. And we shall not, we cannot turn back. We come too far to turn around. We cannot betray our ancestors. And we cannot betray future generations. So you cannot, I never felt like giving up. Never felt like giving up. There are, this is a question about sort of the responsibility of people in power. So how have policies on civil rights changed from 63 to 2014, and why don't people in power act? I think um, the second part of that question might be the, the one that we're most interested in hearing. So people in power, what responsibility do they have for justice in this world? Well, I, I think it's a different climate, it's a different environment. Uh, even today, we look look at Washington. Um, the makeup of the Congress is different. Um, the makeup of the Supreme Court is different. Uh, at one time, during another period, we looked at Washington, especially members of Congress, Supreme Court, as a sympathetic referee in the struggle for civil rights. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where we. Uh, we, we got to create a, a different climate, a different environment. But also, I think the American people are just too quiet. Are uh, too what? They're just too quiet. Too quiet. They need to make some noise. Mm -hmm. You hear that, folks? Yeah. The, the chickens are ready to fly the coop. Now, if, if the people fail to, to, to speak up and speak out, uh, then we're going to have to organize the chickens to do something. <laughs> That's right. Next question. Uh, women like Claudette Colvin's story have been removed from discussions when discussing the movement, which speaks to how respectability politics pl played a role in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. How do we remove those respectability politics from civil rights conversations today? Just, I think people should just, just be yourself. Just go for it. Uh, if, when we do something, we should try to be respectful of the views and arguments of others. But when something is not right, when something is not fair, unjust, you have an obligation to disturb the order of things. You have an obligation to get in the way and make some noise. And that's what I've been doing for more than 50 years. And that's what I will continue to do. You know, I got arrested 40 times during the 60s. And since I've been in Congress, I've been arrested five times. And I may get arrested some more before I leave. <laughs> but what is right and fair, we have to insist. One thing that disturbed me so much so, and my colleague and sister Congresswoman, Vet Clark, been on this issue with so much passion, and it's good to be in a district today. We've been trying to get comprehensive immigration reform. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. They have millions of people living in, in this country on this little piece of real estate and not setting them on a path to citizenship. We all come from someplace else except Native Americans. It's long overdue. Seems to me by the standards of respectability, uh, you are the exception to the rule because uh, you were raised in hell at the March on Washington. So well, I, I just tried to say a few words. <laughs> um. Yeah. What do you think is lacking with the current crop of young activists? Um, and what would you like to see in terms of collective action going forward? I would suggest to and recommend, if I could, to all you young activists, uh, don't necessarily repeat what we did or tried to do, but read the literature. Um, watch the film footage. Come to this exhibit, hmm. really. Art will inspire you. 
I'm telling you, it would inspire you. Being on the campus of Fisk University, going to museums, and seeing how another generation of people stood, just looking at a photograph, listening to music, a song. We would put, sometimes when we left for a protest, getting out of jail, we would sing music, lift you, seeing a wonderful painting can inspire you. A photograph. I remember when the children in Birmingham were being chased by dogs, been picked up and drunk by powerful fire hoses, knocking them down. We would take those photographs and place them on the bulletin board at Fish University, Tennessee State, where I had medical school, and tell people to show up in a hall for a rally and let's march, let's complete the job in, in Nashville. Mm -hmm. That's right. This is a great uh, response to the next question, a segue to the next question. Historically, black colleges and universities and their students led the way in the civil rights movement. We overlook this fact. What is the role of the HBCU today in the ongoing struggle for civil rights? There's a powerful role for these colleges and universities, faculty, uh, administrators, and, and students. Uh, last Saturday, I visited Tougaloo College outside of Jackson, Mississippi. And they have some great work of art there, uh, exhibits. Uh, the, these institutions was, in a sense, free. They were, they were not state-supported. Uh, the student body, the teacher was free to teach. And these schools and the student body can still lead the way. They have educate so many of our leaders and especially first generation that are going off to college. Do you see, this is a spin on this question, uh, so I'm editorializing here, but uh, we know that one of the consequences of, of desegregation uh, is that more young people today can choose from a broader swath of higher ed. And we know, for example, that some HBCUs are struggling with enrollments. Um, are you talking about this in DC, given Howard University's particular a role as one of the leading HBCUs at the forefront of training some of the most important civil rights activists of the 20th century? Uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus and other members uh, of Congress, we spend a great deal of time uh, talking about uh, the role of these colleges and universities and, and their students uh, in the 21st century. Uh, seeing that they get the necessary support scholarship money. It's very expensive to go to college. And uh, a lot of these colleges and universities, and these students need help, they need support. And, and rather than spending more money on, on bombs and guns, mm -hmm. we need to spend it on seeing that all of our children, all of our young people receive the best possible education. This is a question about different kinds of art, and we may have touched on it, but if you want to add to it, the question is, are there different kinds of art that inspired people to fight for freedom, and different kinds of art that kept people fighting for freedom? I think, you know, art is, is you, you bring something, you bring something to a work of art, whether it's a literature, a, a painting, a drawing, music, a play, uh, the person you bring something. Sometimes when I, in my own life, see something, I'm ready to go out there. Uh, I'm ready to go there and try to make it real. Try to, when I was like 18, 19 years old, 
talking to Diane Nash, a James Belva, a, a Bernard Lafayette, a C.T. Vivian, mm -hmm. uh, with Dr. King and some of them. Um, they said, what do you think, John? What should we do? And I would say, we need to find a way to dramatize. I think they thought that's the only word I knew. Uh, <laughs> I've always said, we need to find a way to dramatize the issue, put a face on it. So when you had people marching from Selma to Montgomery, they were picking them up, laying them down, marching. And Dr. King came along saying, there's nothing more powerful than the marching feet of a determined people. Mm. Or, or just people walking in a line, just in a, in, like some of the photographs in this exhibit, that's drawing, showing people walking, not saying a word, just presenting their body as a witness to truth. Mm. But to see the photograph of Ernest Withers, not just Danny Line, but others there. Others to see Charles White and, and others, or Jacob Lawrence. And Jacob Lawrence's piece, Confrontation at the Bridge, depicting what happened in Selma. Mm -hmm. you, you move. I am moved. I am challenged. I don't like seeing dogs. I like dogs, but I don't like seeing dogs running inviting young kids involved in peaceful nonviolent protests. We have a right in this country. We have a right in America to petition our government in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. And no one but no one, no state, no city, county, or the federal government should be able to tell people you don't have a right to stand up and speak up for right. Right on. So we, we are out of time. I want to just say something I think that uh, should have been said earlier. Is it fair to say that in this moment of social media, of Facebook, of Twitter, of Instagram, Snapchat, a few other things that Hootsuite, at some point you're going to say, I don't even know what you're talking about, because I just learned a few of these terms myself, that this was the social media of your generation. Oh. In other words, a way to mass produce a story get it in the hands of young people uh, so that they could either be inspired to tell their own story or to write the first draft of history or to be involved in it itself. That little book, 14 pages, 10 cent, have changed history. The four students in Greensboro, North Carolina on February the 1st, 1960 had read, they had seen that book and they started sitting in and we, those of us in Nashville, read the book. And Jim Lawson, our teacher, told us to digest the essence of that book and follow the teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman John Lewis, March, a new moment for reintroducing this story to young people to help inspire their own movement. I suppose um, Andrew Aiden, who's here, will be tweeting about it so that they know that it's on sale in bookstores around America. Thank you very much for being such a terrific audience. Our, our final comment of the day comes to us from Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Dr. Khalil Gibran and his family Dr. Khalil Gibran Muhammad and his family, to Councilwoman Lori Combo, to Arnold Lehman, the distinguished director of this outstanding institution, and our curators, Ms. Jones and Ms. Caban, to Mr. Lehman's team, and to all who were gathered, to my dear colleague, the distinguished gentleman from Atlanta, Georgia, the living legend, the Mandela of our time, the Honorable John Lewis. <laughs> On
on behalf of the people of the 9th Congres Congressional District, myself, and the Honorable ha Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, who regrets his absence during this afternoon uh, due to a family obligation, his son's 10th birthday. He sends his fondest regards, but we want to take this opportunity to express our gratitude for what you have shared with us today. Aren't we just blessed to have been witness to this conversation? Today uh, marks a historic day here in Brooklyn, here at the Brooklyn Museum. And for all of us, individually and collectively, to have witnessed this outstanding conversation, to put us all in a place where we can sort of catch our bearings on not only what has happened in our past, but what we are facing currently and what we can use as inspiration for our future. Certainly the exhibition uh, is a reminder of uh, our history. But as our congressman has said to us today, should be an inspiration uh, for us to make some noise, for us to get in the way, to stand up uh, as we deal with the 21st century's version of a struggle uh, amongst humanity. So I wanted to take this opportunity, John, to say to you as a beneficiary of your work during the civil rights movement and as a colleague who reveres all that you continue to do. You know, Congressman John Lewis is co-sponsor of the new Voting Rights Act of 2013. <laughs> and while we clap, we should all feel a bit nervous that we are relitigating all of these issues that we thought all the blood that was shed had already settled. But we want to thank you for your courage of conviction, for your philosophy of nonviolence, and for the caring and passion that you have for all of humanity. You are a living legend and an example to all who have encountered you and who will encounter you throughout all of your life's work. You are a blessing to all of us, and we, we are just grateful. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>